feel more intensively than our higher education. So there's a lot more unfunded mandates being imposed on um, uh, on for-profit firms because they have more regulatory bodies in which they have to answer to. Uh, and we have fewer regulatory bodies in higher education. Kind of interested. Now, the first really big dog in this discussion is what's referred to as Baumol's cost disease. Now, this is really an opportunity, uh, a cost argument. And basically, the argument is this. Technological improvement, technology does not improve very rapidly in the service industries. In fact, sometimes it just doesn't improve at all. This is a theory from the 1960s and the early 1970s. Um, very, a very famous guy, William J. Baum, uh, and another guy, uh, Bowen, another Bowen, uh, was his co-author on this. And the idea works like this. There is productivity improvement in the rest of the economy. So the rest, of, the rest of the economy is willing to pay higher real wages for more productive people. Uh, and as a result, that requires service industries to pay higher wages just to maintain their hold on good people. Right? Now this makes considerable sense when you're talking about knowledge workers. So in other words, this is an argument that really does apply to faculty members. All right? but the rest of the, I'm sorry, but this is the truth. The rest of the people that are hired by these institutions are basically the same kind of people that are being hired elsewhere in the economy. All right. Uh, so the unique resource that's employed by uh, uh, by higher education are the faculty members. All right. So this argument here, these external two right here, is whenever you hear somebody. Uh, at the higher echelons in higher education talking about trying to explain to you what cost, what drives cost, they're going to talk about those two things right there. They're going to talk to you about government mandates and they're going to talk to you about Baumol's cost disease. And the reason for that should be patently obvious. Because both those are external sources and if you can, if you can lay off all of the cost increase to those external origins, then higher education is scot-free. You know, we have no responsibility for our own cost. If you can play that off. Unfortunately, all right, there are other explanations for these increases in cost. All right? uh, and they have an internal origin. Now, the first of these is what's referred to as bundling services. You, you should think of this in terms of your experience with your cable or satellite television provider. All right? You will notice you are not allowed to make your own bundle with respect to all of the cable, the channels that you take. If I were allowed to do that, I'd, change, I'd choose maybe 10, 10 channels. That's it, that's all I'd want for okay, at most. But they won't let you do that because by bundling it together, they can force you to buy uh, services from channels that you will never actually even use, nor do you want it. So it's a way of extracting more revenue per customer by bundling these things together. Now, also, you may remember the Microsoft antitrust case. You remember what that was about? There was another bundling question. What was being bundled there? Windows. With? Windows. Yeah, the search engine. Yeah, the search engine. Yeah. The Internet Explorer. You know, with bundling those together. And of course, they were also selling uh, PowerPoint, Excel, and Word, and also bundled as a package as well. All right. So uh, the Justice Department filed suit because of complaints from other um, uh, internet search engines, for instance, against Microsoft in that particular case. Now, the case was resolved, and uh, Microsoft unbundled um, the, the Explorer uh, from the operating system, but I want to make a point. The, e the economics of bundling, there are two circumstances under which you can, you can make an economic justification for bundling. The first of these is when there are production externalities in the goods that are being bundled. In other words, where you've got a situation where if you bundle them together, you can produce them at a lower cost than if they're, if they're sold separately. All right? Now, you could make that case for Microsoft. Because my, uh, the Justice Department had a very difficult time proving that there was any damage to customers because of the fact that the price, the real price of the bundle software was going down. Not up. Right? Now, we in 
higher education bundle a lot of stuff together, progressively more stuff together. But what's happening with cost? The cost has been going very, up very rapidly. So it would be very easy for the Justice Department to make an antitrust suit uh, case against higher education based upon that cost history and based upon the frequency of bundling things together. Now what I'm talking about here, bundling here, is uh, a lot of things that are now provided on the campus. And this is also, you know, notice what happens to prices at airports for food and for recreation or anything else. What's typically true of the prices you have to pay at airports? Is it lower? A lot higher. Because there's no competition, right? There's no competition for it. All right, so that's another example of uh, the cost impacts of uh, putting things together like this. And of course, this is bundling things like uh, luxury living accommodations, gourmet foods, uh, really lavish entertainment, um, the really extraordinary health clubs and things like that that are being provided so many. My favorite one was the lazy river that flows through the yeah. student union building and people are swimming and, and riding on inner tubes along this thing. Uh, the waterfalls, the classic rock climbing wall, all of those sorts of things that are being added uh, and offered inside. And of course, along with that, things like international travel being bundled with your experience at, at, uh, at, at that. And the classic bundled item, big time sports, you got to entertain them, right? Uh, so that's one source of, uh, of increasing cost. Now, a moment in before passing on on that one, think that what, what this does to, um, to the student debt issue. Since these things are bundled, basically the student cannot avoid paying for them. So when they borrow money or when their family goes into debt to pay their room and board fees, things like this, they're actually borrowing more of the money for luxury uh, consumption goods, private goods. Right? You know, what they're paying, what they're borrowing the money for is not exclusively for education services. Now, that is a fundamentally poor personal finance decision to borrow money for consumption goods. You know, non-durable consumption goods. That's really not a good idea to do that, all right, in your own personal finance. So that's another reason why we need to be particularly worried about this bundling thing here, all right? Uh, and the, and, and the, the, the final thing, the other big dog, as I say here, is Bowen's Rule. It's written by an economist who published this in 1980. And if you actually read his book from 1980, and I don't have the title, I'm it at hand, uh, it's Josie Bass's book. But uh, his, his whole book, you read it and you think about where we are right now in 2011, you just go, oh my God, why didn't somebody, why didn't somebody actually read this and think about it and do the research on it that would follow up uh, to prevent all of this from happening? Because now we're in a really deep hole because we did not listen to Bowen in 1980. So I encourage you to read this book, go back and read it, and read it from this perspective. Uh, and uh, what's his first name again? H.R. Bowen, Howard R. Bowen. We'll put a link to it on the website after the lecture. Okay. Now, what is Bowen's Rule? Well, Bowen's Rule, uh, it comes under two names. It's either Bowen's Rule or the Revenue Theory of Cost. Either one of those. That'll get you back to Bowen. Uh, the Bowen's Rule, though, is that uh, higher education institutions raise all the money they can. They spend all the money they raise on a seemingly unlimited number of projects that might conceivably improve quality. In my four decades of higher education, I never saw an individual, never saw a department, never saw an institution that when they wanted money for something, they didn't couch it in terms of improving the quality of the institution. It's always put in that respect, okay? Um, the other one, I see, the, the revenue theory is is the notion that um, revenues drive the cost, all right, for this. And that comes right here from the, the financial, the financial uh, uh, model that we all live with, which is a balanced budget model, all 
family. In other words, we're a nonprofit institution. The reason why we're a nonprofit institution is because uh, we are producing a quasi-public good in higher education, and the society would like to have more of that quasi-public good produced. So rather than take the profits out of the out of the organization, we leave the profits in so they'll have more revenue to produce more of that quasi-public good. All right, that's the idea behind it. That's why we have tax exempt status uh, and all of that, and therefore have the ability to raise charitable donations. But the problem with it, of course, is that um, the whatever revenue we have is what is going to be spent, in essence. Unless you've got a really strong financial officer, somebody who will put away reserves and can resist the president and can resist all the faculty departments and everything else demanding more resources, which is not an easy thing for anybody to do. So what that actually means in practice is that every time you raise the revenue cap, then costs will rise to fill in that. People will spend more money. All right? So then you can see, whenever you improve access through more government programs, that's more money in the coffers, and what follows immediately from that is more expenditure. 